Welcome into the latest edition of ESPN FC. I'm Dan Thomas, joined in the studio today by Craig Burley. We also welcome to the programme Nader Manure is with us, as is Shaka Hislop and Ian Dark's Curtains. Join us for today's show <laughs> as we're, of course, be discussing the big news today coming out of England. Wesley Fofana looks like he's on his way from Leicester to Chelsea uh, for reported 70 million euros plus add-ons. Quite the investment for the 21-year-old Craig. We know for a while, obviously, he wanted to move. Do you like this deal? Uh, I like the player, but I, I, it's been so long since I've seen him play regular because he had a broken leg or a broken ankle, mm -hmm. uh, bad injury. Uh, had looked good up to that point, still only a youngster. It's Van Dyke money, isn't it? Virgil van Dijk, I mean, transfer fees have gone crazy. We talked about that in the show, but Virgil van Dijk had already played in Holland. He played at Southampton. He played at Celtic and had come through, not all in that order, obviously Celtic before Southampton, but had built a bit of a career. And then Liverpool went in and snapped him up for, I think, 75 million or thereabouts. This is not a kick in the backside off it for a youngster who is a very talented young player, there's no doubt, but he's been out for a long period. I think played only seven games last year. Yeah. But that's the market we're in, so big opportunity for him, but no guarantee it's going to work. Uh, he's still quite raw, is that fair to say, Nathan? Um Perhaps, perhaps, but he's still, he's still a very good player, and I think I can see why Chelsea would be interested in him. Obviously, the fee itself raises some more questions, but as I say, I think he's, I think he's a very good player, and I think ultimately, ultimately for Chelsea, they're going to be betting on his ceiling, and his ceiling is very high. You know, this could be a potential, you know, future international, you know, somebody that could help Chelsea win the league and the like. And even if he doesn't necessarily hit the ground running and start playing a ton of games this season, you know, they're not signing him for, you know, nine months or 10 months or whatever it is. They're signing for multiple years. And the belief is he'll get better year in, year out in the infrastructure that they have. So I think I, I see it, I understand it. And, you know, it seemed like one of those areas which they needed to sort of like shore up for Chelsea was at the back. And you know, you've got Thiago Silva for as good as he is. You know, he's not getting any younger. So now you've got somebody who may be, he could take under his wing and who knows maybe the impact he can have can be as significant as Thiago Silva's in the future. How highly do you rate him, Ian? Well, I think he's very gifted. He, he's quick across the ground. He's alert for a defender. He's very well regarded in the game as Craig said. He had that very bad injury which kept him out for a long time. But um, yeah, Chelsea need to sign top quality defenders because you know, they've lost Rudiger and they've lost Christian Cern and Thiago Silva's not getting any older. But it, this is kind of part of a scattergun approach, I think, by Chelsea. I think they might be even busier in the next few days as well. They seem close to signing Obama Yang and they seem pretty close to signing uh, Anthony Gordon from Everton as well. So uh, keep watching this window. How much of a game changer, Shaq, is this signing with regards to Chelsea's prospects this season? Well, we'll, we'll, we'll have to wait to find out. I think I'm like everybody else. I think Fofana is a wonderful talent. Um, I, but I, I like Craig. I'm, I'm not going to cast any dispersions as far as the transfer fee goes. And none of it seems to make any kind of sense. If you get 10 years out of Fofana, then yes, the, the money is worth it. Um, but just in terms of pure talent and who Chelsea need, I think it's a, it's a significant step in the right direction. They've wanted to bring a centre back in. And while I, I understand what Ian is saying, I think this is less scattergun than some of the other Chelsea signings we've seen so far. Um, but we have to see how, how he fares and, and, and how he fits into this Chelsea lineup. So they get Aubameyang as well. What does that do for their prospects? Makes them, well, gives them a good prospect. They've been in the top four, but that's, right. that's about it for me. They're not... They're not in the category of Manchester City and obviously Liverpool are not up and running yet. So there's a lot of people writing Liverpool off very, very quickly. Uh, but Chelsea, yeah, I mean, it's going to help. But I think a lot of the guys had them outside the top four, myself included. Uh, but another centre-half and potentially a striker, I think it could possibly be the difference. But it'll be a tight run race with Arsenal and Tottenham, in my opinion. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, I mean, it's, it beefs up the squad. Koulibaly's obviously got a suspension. That's very short term. Cucurella was is a good player, but he was 60 odd million. I bet when they phoned him and said, they're paying 60 million for me, even he wants to say, you must be nuts. <laughs> That's the way the transfer market is. Buying young, talented players who potentially could go on to be something greater than they are, but it's a risk. And, and you know, gone of the days, it seems that you went out and you brought in world-class finished articles for the this for half that money. I just can't make a head and a tail of this transfer market. I say it every time I come on the show, but it's driven by 
the way the Premier League is now, the way the clubs do the business. And what I would say is that Leicester City, who are already having palpitations about their manager, about their squad, about mm. the recruitment, Brendan Rodgers has talked about it, he's under pressure, this does them no, and him no favours whatsoever. No, no Leicester, at all. Leicester had a poor start to the yeah, season, yeah, obviously, yeah. Ian. And of course, who do they play this weekend? Chelsea. <laughs> Yeah, and Fafana, of course, won't be playing. That has already been uh, decided. He didn't play last week either because his mind wasn't in the right place. Apparently, he didn't really want to train with the Leicester team. So, Brendan Rodgers took the only decision there. So, uh, that move looks very, very imminent, doesn't it? Yeah, I think Leicester City, uh, that's boiling out to be quite a story there because they've let in eight goals already. You wonder what goes on on the training ground there because last season they couldn't stop leaking goals, especially from set pieces. And that's carried on at the start of this season and they seem to be in a bit of a financial hole um, in terms of going out and getting players and they've got Newcastle knocking on the door wanting Madison as well as the imminent Fafana departure so it doesn't look great for Leicester just at the moment. Now let's just take a look at the odds going into that clash. Chelsea of course looking to bounce back after that disappointing defeat against Leeds uh, last weekend. No surprise the bookies have them as, as big favourites going into this tie. Leicester at 6-1. to one. Chelsea can't muck this up can they Nadam? Uh, you wouldn't expect so, but obviously, you know, with Koulibaly out and the result that they had last week, they're not exactly perfect, but I think in some ways, going back home and playing a Leicester City side who feel a bit wounded, it wouldn't necessarily say it's a layout because it's definitely not that, but it feels more like a comfortable fixture because for as good as Leicester can be in attack, you know, as Ian was saying, they do have significant weaknesses at the back. It doesn't feel like they're being as progressive as, say, they were in the, last, in the years gone by, you know, when they were really challenging for the top four. So you see the odds, you know, they're like that for a reason. Are we really expecting Leicester to really go and take to go and take it to Chelsea at the bridge, you know, take them apart and be defensively strong? Probably not. But you know, at the end of the day, this is football, and you know, this is still why we tune in. But for me, I think it has to be Chelsea. Yeah, you would expect a response, wouldn't you, Shaq? Sorry, repeat that, Dan. You would expect a response. <laughs> oh, oh, absolutely. I, I, and you couldn't pick a better team than, than Leicester City. I'll, I'll be honest. I'm, I'm concerned about Leicester and, and their fortunes this season. I, I think it could be a long season for them. Um, and, and given who Chelsea are, or Ch who Chelsea hope to be, this is, is, is the perfect opponent at, at just the right time. We'll see wh whether those, those signings for Fana and, and then Obama Yang to come get over the line and, and how they fare. But, but this is one that any version of Chelsea should be winning. No Thomas Tuchel on the touchline. He's <coughs> suspended for his antics uh, with Antonio Conte. Off. Does that make any difference? Shouldn't make a great deal of difference to these players unless, there's a, unless they've replaced them with a bunch of kids right. that need to be told uh, where they need to stand and where they need to run and how they need to go about it. His message will be before <coughs> the game and so there'll be no excuses. Leicester, I thought, would be going into this game a different team. I think there's now, and I'll go back to Chelsea, but Le Leicester City and Brendan Rodgers, I bet Brendan Rodgers is wishing he jumped ship 18 months ago when a few of these clubs were sniffing around him. The club seemed to be a lot more stable. They had a bad season, they started to lose players, the players were about injuries, and then players were being talked about transfers, but I thought they were going to, he was going to be backed in the summer. Now, maybe the tragedy with the owner and the passing of the ownership to other members of the family, I think it's his son, has changed the outlook and, and the financial situation. I, I, I don't know, but I fully expected Leicester with a good coach to go and back him again in the summer. And all we've heard from Leicester is there are hardly any players coming in. It's talk about James Justin, who's a terrific player, Fafana, uh, with even talking about Vardy going, but I know he's you know, heading towards what, 35. Uh, Tielemans, Madison. And so they are, they are a fractured jigsaw. Yeah. And Brendan Rodgers has gone from a man who has been touted with almost all the big jobs almost in England, to a man who's clinging, it seems, to, to his job by a fingernail this early in the season. And I don't think it's him. I think it's purely recruitment. I think it's purely transfer talk uh, and the injuries that they had last year. And I think for those reasons, bearing in mind Chelsea got walloped at Leeds, the problems Leicester have, the problems Rodgers has, mm. they can ill afford to have nothing else than the bounce back that you just mentioned. Or there will be more questions on Thomas Tuchel. Yeah, very much so. Meanwhile, something we discussed on Wednesday, of course, in some detail, Alexander Isak making that huge money move 
from La Liga to Newcastle. It was confirmed today. Obviously, Ian, you follow a lot of La Liga games. On Wednesday, we were kind of scratching our heads as to why they paid such a big fee. Would you agree? Well, the first thing it said to me was they're fed up with Callum Wilson's injuries, which are recurring. He has a lot of them. He's a talented player, but he's got another hamstring issue now, and he's missed an awful lot of football. And I think Eddie Howe's looked at it, and the people at Newcastle have looked at it and thought, we've got to go out there and get somebody we can rely on and we like. And they like Isaac a lot. I mean, I do. I like him when I've seen him playing for Real Sociedad, but this is pretty big step up into the Premier League. I think my hunch is he's gonna gonna work okay for them. I think uh, he's a nice player. It's a big money move. They believe in it, and most of the things they've done so far in the market with the new money seem to have come off. Is that the Callum Wilson that anointed himself as the man that's going to be on the plane uh, to Qatar with England? <laughs> uh, or did I misread that quote? from a, a seemingly very confident young man off the back of his goal against Manchester City. I tell you, nothing against young uh, Isaac's uh, international player. He's, uh, again, we saw him play last week. We've seen him play before. He's OK. He's OK. Uh, I, never, I don't think he's ever going to be a superstar, but he might be a decent player. But, oh, my God. I, I'm got, the Premier League is now should be called You've Won a, it's the You've Won a Watch League. Mm -hmm. You've won the lottery, the big bonanza league. This is what it is now. No wonder everybody wants to come to the Premier League, whether you're already in England, whether you're Scottish, Irish, Welsh, or from South America or continental Europe. They are just throwing it about. You only have to be Mr. Average, and you're in there. Bang, 40, 50 million, 100 grand a week, one a watch. If it doesn't work out, you sort off somewhere else. Nothing, not because we're talking about the, the young man from Sociedad. That's a generalisation yep. across the board. It's no wonder when people say, oh, everybody wants to come to the Premier League. Of course they do. They don't all want to come because go to Burnley last year, <laughs> go to the Norwiches, go to travel to Bournemouth, all these sort of games. They're not, they don't want to come for that. They want to come for the money. And when you see the money that's been dished out, how long can this last? I know we've been talking about that for a few years, yeah. but how long can this last before this crashes and burns? Because the only thing that keep, is keeping it going is Middle East, Saudi Arabia, partly America and other things. But eventually this crazy, crazy world of the Premier League money has to just be capped off somewhere. But Isaac, of course, coming in as a big signing for Newcastle, and like it or not, and like it or not, Nadam, that sort of price tag can weigh heavy on a player. Yeah, it certainly can. I think, uh, you know, if he's coming across to the Premier League just looking to just get a feel for it, you know, he could be in for a big shock if he's arriving in Newcastle because there's going to be a big expectation upon him. I think anybody that leads the line there, you know, you have to buy into the city, buy into the culture, buy into the history. You know, as you walk towards the stadium, seeing statues of Alan Shearer and stuff like that. So, you know, even though you're not going to be Alan Shearer, they almost kind of want you to have that sort of impact and want you to buy in to be feeling the true passion of being a Geordie as such. But at the end of the day, you know, the fee itself, it's not what, it's not the figure that he put on himself. It's the fee that Newcastle decided to agree with, with his other clubs. So, you know, it's, um, it's going to be a tough spot to be in. There's going to be lots of expectation, especially given the fact that for them, they do feel like they are progressing and they are getting better. So is he going to be another piece to this in terms of their quest for success? I think the fans will believe so. I think Newcastle will believe so as well. So for somebody who's essentially, you know, still potentially not hit his ceiling quite yet, He's going to have to go. He's going to have to buy into it. He's going to have to work hard and realise that the Premier League is, at times, very, very different to La Liga. But with the attributes that he has, and if they've got the right infrastructure and the right manager in play, there's no reason to see why he can't be successful. What does this mean for Newcastle going forward this season, Shaq? Um, I think Newcastle have to have to be aiming to finish in the top six and get into one of those European places, even if it's the, the Europa League or Europa Conference League. Given some of their struggles over, over recent years, I think that it will be will be a wonderful achievement. Um, given the second half to to, the, uh, to last season that they had under Eddie Howe, the, the the signings they made both in January and again this summer, um, I think that's what the fans are hoping for. At the very least, they're expecting Newcastle to threaten those those those, those spots. Uh, the boys will be back for extra time to answer your questions. Be sure to check that out, as always, over on our YouTube channel. And don't forget to subscribe when you're there.
What a difference a result makes, of course, for Manchester United fans. Finally, they had something to smile about after being Liverpool on Monday. They'll be looking to continue that momentum into Saturday's clash at St Mary's against Southampton in the early game. Uh, the bookies have them as favourites to take all three points uh, from the South Coast. Ian Nadem, uh, Shaka with us. Nadem, they can't muck this up, can they? No, 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 of course not. And, you know, me being the only person to put them in the top four, of course they're going to win. This is the charge yeah. for Man United to get I back see. towards the top. You know, yeah. it all makes sense. Obviously, I'm going to be blowing hot and cold every week, depending on how it goes. But, <laughs> you know, I think in this game that they'll have against Southampton, I don't think Southampton, even though they're playing at home, won't be as open as, say, Liverpool were for some of those moments within that match. So it's going to be a different sort of tie from them where they're probably going to be on the front foot for the majority, but come up against a side who maybe defensively will have a, that sort of mindset first over attack. But, you know, what we saw against Liverpool, it was, in my opinion, it was, it was pretty good. It was pretty good. It was, it, the Old Trafford was rocking. The players were energetic. You can see that, you know, they've got it in their minds now. They need to run first before they do anything else. So if they're going to be taking that form on board and recognise the importance of that result, because I think that was Liverpool's first loss in the league in 21 games. If you're a team that inflicts that upon them, then you must be, in some ways, capable of putting out good performances. So I think as they go down to Southampton, if they've got the right mindset, then I think they'll be fine. But if they present the mindset that they had maybe against Brentford away, the game might be long gone by the time they even sort of realise what they need to do. But as it stands, I believe that the charge starts now, Dan, and that quest for the top <laughs> four continues with, with a win away at Southampton. Imagine, Craig, if they muck this up. All that goodwill, all that optimism. Well, back in the old days, you used to walk in the dressing room during the week or the training ground, whatever it was, with all your buddies, your colleagues, and quite a lot of them would be sitting there reading the paper. Right. Right. Not sure how many are reading papers now, <laughs> uh, but the point being is, if I was the manager, I'd be going in swiping in and away all week that they've been reading. Right. Because don't believe that some of the headlines, which were, I think, correct, saying magnificent performance, that's more like it, that kind of generalisation, forget that. Because that was one game, and I think I heard Ten Hag talk about it, I think it was to Sky Sports after the game when he was talking about, I think he is a very focused guy like that, whether these players are remains to be seen about no point talking about this if we muck it up next week. Sure. So, you know, that would really just put them back uh, back on the bottom step again. Uh, Southampton are a team, I, I think I mentioned this to you, I've got them close to the relegation zone this year. I think it's going to be a struggle for them. There's already some rumblings coming out at the start of the season about some of the players in Ralph, Ralph Hasenhuttle. They've had a couple of decent results uh, unexpectedly coming back from 2-0 down at home against Leeds. But if Man United apply themselves in that manner in which they did against Man United, particularly for the first half an hour, then it's, it's theirs to throw away. Yeah. It's theirs to throw away. And it's about, they need to put a marker down to say, OK, it is Southampton, but yeah, Monday night was not an anomaly. That's the standard we've set. This is the way we're going to carry on. Where it takes us is where it takes us. But that's the standard of play. I think I might be right in saying... Early in the season last year, or certainly before Solskjaer was sacked, they went down to the south coast. They either drew or were beaten. It was not a pretty performance, and they need a better one than they did last year. Uh, we know that Martial will be out for that tie, of course. He came on at, at half-time, Ian. But looking at that starting eleven that Craig said was so good in that opening half an hour, you stick with it? No Maguire? No Ronaldo? Um, the w big question, I think, is does he play Casemiro, really, who's trained all week and is ready and he hasn't bought him just to sit around, has he, on the bench? So I'm going to guess that Casemiro might come into the starting lineup for this game, maybe at the expense of McTominay. That would be a bit tough luck on him. But yeah, I mean, the boys are right. Manchester United have got to prove in this game when they're not playing a big grudge game like Liverpool that they really have turned a corner that they can produce that sort of intensity again week in week out so in a way this is as big a game as the Liverpool game I think for them they've got to prove here now that they are going to kick on with proper fight proper organisation and you know one or two players were revelations really compared to the form we've seen from them Rashford, Sancho so let's see no Ronaldo, no Maguire, Shaq, for you? No, no, they, they can't feature. I, I think he goes with the same starting 11. And I, I take Ian's point that with Casemiro coming in, um, he, he may get a start. But I, I would go with the same starting 11 after that, that performance against, against Liverpool. Maybe leave Casemiro for another week or so. Well, no. it goes back to the point uh, I think Stevie was making early in the week about Ronaldo, where 
Back in the day, it would have been a bus journey. Today, it'll be a private jet, but it's still travel all the way down to the south coast. Yeah. To sit there in the dreary south coast. Well, Southampton's quite nice. Everything I lived there for a while. It's Everything, lovely. It can't be nice if you live there. It was beautiful. Every, I mean, that's just that's <laughs> down there. Every time I would go there, it's dreary and dull. And it's not Portsmouth. And uh, <laughs> and traveling all the way down there, to sit in the bench and be a bit part. Why would you change it? Why would you change the team unless you have to with injury? It makes no sense. There's no place in the team for Maguire. There's no place in the team for Ronaldo. What he had last week worked just fine. But it goes back to that point with this transfer window closing. A, a, a plane trip down, a hotel, being away, you know, and really knowing as a guy who's been the, well, one of two top players for 15 years is sitting on his backside at Southampton watching others who have not played well in the last year mm. but had played well on Monday and watching them going out and doing their stuff. That has to just whet his appetite to say to his advisors, just for God's sake, find a way, get me out of here. Do you know what today was? Did you watch? It was the Europa League draw today, which of course... Amounts- and that's why I didn't watch it, Daniel. <laughs> you didn't watch the Champions League draw either, And that's I why bet. I didn't watch it either. What's the point watching it when you can find out at the end? There you go. Got hurt. Here it is then. Manchester United along with the Real Sociedad Sherry fan, Omonia. Uh, Neil Lennon's team. Is it? I've seen some... He said apparently Neil has been talking about the atmosphere there. Right. The fireworks. Yeah. All that sort of stuff. Oh. I mean, imagine these players have never seen fireworks. <laughs> Frighten them to death, you know what I mean? Like dogs. <laughs> but, uh, no, that's Neil, Neil Lennon's coaching out there. Uh, uh, you uh, look right. at it overall. You learn some every day. Uh, Ian, how seriously will they take that competition? Um, I, I think they'll want to lift a trophy. They haven't had one, have they, for goodness knows how long now, Manchester United. Weren't Sheriff Tiris Bowl the team that went to Real Madrid and won in the Champions League last oh. year? I think they were. Yes, it is, they? Ian. So, Good knowledge. <laughs> from Moldova, aren't they? So yes. you think United had coast through that group, Arsenal as well. They always do that, put the Premier League as teams as the favourites. But, um, you know, they haven't often won it. So there are some dangerous teams in there who will be going hell for leather to try and win the thing. I, I would love to have seen what those odds were before Monday night's right. against Liverpool. Because there's no way, not a cat in hell's chance, that they were 81 second favourites before they played Liverpool. Not a chance. I don't care who's in it. I don't care if it's the Glenbuck cherry pickers. I don't care. <laughs> Who are they? Yeah, exactly. I don't care. Because they couldn't win a game for Toffee, Man United, before that. Yeah. I mean, so it's amazing. Amazing. One result, one good performance, and all of a sudden, they're back as second favourites. But still, you've got Europe. the Champions League teams to drop down as well and all that, so... Um, yeah, that's what, you tell, what, you try, what, you try to explain how it works to me? Well, yes, exactly. You look like, why would you bet on them now? When well, who's betting on them? Idiots. <laughs> I don't know. Well, all I'm saying is, there could no way I've been 81 <laughs> right. before Monday night's performance. Um, no way. Uh, meanwhile, Manchester City taking on Crystal Palace, which you're going to look at the both teams here and you think, oh, well, this is an easy win for City. But history has not been kind to City in this, in this tie. No, it hasn't. Crystal Palace are playing very well as well this season. Look at the performance they put on at Liverpool. I think mm. Wilf Zahar has moved on another level. His finishing is getting better and better. Um, Palace have won at City a couple of times, including last season. Remember that goal Andros Townsend scored there a few yeah. seasons ago? I don't think anyone will ever forget that. They won 2-0 there last year. They kept a clean sheet against City um, at Soho's Park last season. So I think they're capable. I'm not saying they're definitely going to get something out of the game but I think they're capable of um, giving Manchester City a bit of a a run for their money particularly as Newcastle quite interestingly last week went bold against City most teams sort of sit back rather frightened of them damage limitation I wonder if teams are starting to think I'll tell you what let's go for it a little bit and see what they're like if we can get them onto the back foot as Newcastle did last week so I'm interested to see how Palace do go about it. Uh, Nadem, Ian coming out and saying they're definitely going to get something, Palace, from this tie. Do you agree? <laughs> I think how they did last year was, you know, was very good with the win and with the draw. Finding a way to stop City from scoring is very impressive. But I think on this particular occasion, like Palace have started one, well can see the strengths that they have. I think last week against Villa, they looked very good. They went a goal down, but the reaction was almost instant. And then they basically controlled the game from there. And I think there were certain parts of that Liverpool game where I thought they looked really good. But to then bring it back to sort of like a more thoughtful manner in that Liverpool game, I thought the worst they played was when Liverpool went down to 10 men. 
And I think that kind of shows that for as good as they are, they're not quite there yet in terms of being able to fully command games against some of the best sides. And I think playing against City here, the fact that it's at the Etihad is going to be the difference, in my opinion, between how they approach it compared to how Newcastle approach it, playing City on the front foot with 50,000, 60,000 fans begging them to do so and celebrating every positive moment that they have. I think they'll be defensively solid and you've got out balls to Zaha, Eze, dribblers like that, Ayu as well, and Schlupp running with the ball. So they will be dangerous from that standpoint. But I think for City, all they have to do is look back at what happened last season and know that they have to do better. They have to sort of minimise those mistakes, but make sure that they're very much aware of sort of the, the attacking threat that Palace will have on the break. So I still, I see City winning it, but you know, it would be very interesting in this game if Palace did take a lead because for them, they can continue playing in the same style. Whereas for City, maybe that sense of urgency would have to sort of get ramped up a little bit, which maybe might play into Palace's hands. I don't think there's a cat and hell's chance that Crystal Palace will try and come out and have a go at, at Man City. Right. I think Man City would love that. I mean, I know Newcastle got their, got their dander up a little bit uh, and people would, yeah, and it did look as if City were flustered. But that, and I don't think it was down to Newcastle per se, but I, I think it's one of the worst halves, second, well, one of the worst 20 minute periods of passing the ball, I think I've seen from City in a long time. And it wasn't all down to Newcastle pressing. It was, I, I saw Rodri and, 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 and Walker and Stones and others with five and 10 yards on the ball and just dilly-dallying on. Yeah. And it, it, it just seemed to me that they needed a, a, a huge rocket up their backside. Uh, so I don't think we'll see that City again. We'll rarely see them as sloppy as we did and periods in that Newcastle game. And then we saw the other side of them, the brilliance. Uh, but I think Palace will be coy and they'll look for that bit of pace and power up front, a bit like Palace did against Liverpool. But if they do try and open up, I think ultimately it'll be cannon fodder uh, for Man City if that happens. And I think that's why there's no chance of City trying to have a pop at them. Uh, I think they'll be very cute in the way they, uh, Palace, sorry, way cute in the way they approach the game. Uh, meanwhile, Spurs are going to continue their good start to the season. Chat, they're away against Forest. Any concern here for Antonio Conte's side? No, I, I, I don't think. I don't see a real um, issue for Spurs coming into this one. And, and listen, I understand Forest, the last home game, beat West Ham and then went and drove away to Everton. Um, but I, I think there was a lot of emotion in, in that Forest West Ham game, given being the first game back in the Premier League um, and, and truly Forrest can count themselves a little bit lucky. Uh, I, I don't I don't see uh, Lightning striking twice in, in that regard. This Spurs team is just way too disciplined and, and, and will get the job done. I, I don't feel so Forrest are, are anywhere near good enough to overturn Spurs. Have you spoken to your grandson yet about Forrest's season? Is he concerned? Uh, I've actually. Yeah? What's he saying? Uh... I don't know, it was a little bit, he wasn't making much sense. Well, <laughs> he takes after his grandfather. He went to the West Ham game. <laughs> right. He was telling me. Yeah. He wasn't sure who they were playing next. I think he is going to the game. But, uh, yeah, I agree with Shaq. I think the 17 players now, I think, Serge Aurier have been the latest. Don't know if he's looking for a house or not. We'll have to have a think about that over the weekend. Yeah, I know. There's a lot of renters <laughs> that could be around. The price has gone up. Yeah, exactly. Oh, you know. Yeah. And, uh, I just feel Spurs are organised. Harry Kane up front, he finished them off. I think, yeah, I just feel Spurs a couple of goals to the good in that one. A bit too much for Forrest, but they've made a good fest of it so far. Uh, finally, Liverpool against Bournemouth. If you want to face a side, Ian, after what happened at Old Trafford, Bournemouth pretty much tick all the boxes. Yeah, I mean, Bournemouth have had a horrible run of games. I think they've had to play Manchester City and Arsenal, and now they've got to go to, to Anfield. But, you know, who'd have thought Liverpool would only have two points after three matches? They haven't looked themselves at all, but I honestly can't see Bournemouth giving them that much of an argument. They're just not in at that kind of level. And I think, you know, Jurgen Klopp will want to see Liverpool slip more into gear than we've seen them so far. So I'm expecting a pretty comfortable home win for Liverpool here. If he doesn't. And I was going to say, anything else is just a disaster, yeah. isn't it? Absolutely. Anything else than a statement is, is a disaster, particularly if, if City get the win. Yeah. Probably will, although the graphic we put up shows Palace have been pretty good against them. Uh, but yeah, I mean, it would be a huge worry. I think a huge worry, and there's been reports this week about we talked about the midfield uh, a few days ago and there's been reports about one or two players. De Jong uh, has been mentioned. I don't know if anybody's sort of poo-pooed that. Right. I don't know. But 
all of a sudden we're hearing things about maybe trying to get one or two players in that maybe they weren't thinking about, and this would be uh, anything other than a good two or three goal victory. Right. I think would be a, a worry for Jurgen Klopp. That kind of leads me on. It's, is it just about result tomorrow, Nadem, getting it done, or do they need a good performance as well in addition to that? No, I think it's about performance as well. I think the result, as you can see from the odds, people are very clear in thinking that Liverpool are going to win. But if it's a scrappy win against a side like Bournemouth who aren't in the best shape whatsoever, and I think that does raise questions because, as, as we just said there, the expectation is that they're going to win anyway. I think you want to see them start moving the ball well, look more like themselves. And I think if they don't manage to do that, then, yeah, maybe the questions will be asked, but... You know, this is this is Liverpool, even though they've had the start that they've had. You know, which, how many people are really saying they're going to struggle this season? It doesn't feel quite like that yet. They've got players to come back in, but then they've still got some of their key performers and some players who know, you know for example, like Van Dijk, who haven't started the season at their best, who will be striving to get better. So I think this game on the weekend, in some ways, it almost feels like the perfect game for them because they can go hmm. and be ruthless, ruthless at the back, ruthless in midfield, ruthless up front and try and create that sort of atmosphere at Anfield, which they've been used to for the past few years. So for me, like, I don't see it as being anywhere near a crisis, and I think this could be a statement victory for them. Well, if they don't win, though, Stevie will not be happy. He is with us on tomorrow's show to still be very positive about Liverpool, negative about Arsenal. Be sure of that, and be sure to join us. Meanwhile, on Sunday, we've got a good double header for you with both Real Madrid and Barcelona in action. Ian Dark with us to look ahead to both of those games. Let's start off, shall we, with the defending champions away against Espanyol. And they've started the season really strongly, haven't they, Ian? Yeah, maximum points so far. Um, Benzema's still there. Uh, Vinicius Junior, very good last season. I think those two will be a big threat to whoever they play this season. I think Rodrigo's coming through, isn't he? Now you saw it at the back end of the Champions League last season. And I think a big difference this season is they don't, you know, Casemiro's gone, Kroos and Modric are still around, but they've got Valverde, who's really arrived. Camavinga looks a good player. Schuermany as well, so they can rotate in that midfield as well. So Real Madrid are gonna be there or thereabouts again, no question this season. We saw it, didn't we, in the second half of Celta Vigo in particular, Craig, where they just completely bossed everything. Yeah, yeah, we saw that a lot from them last year, actually, where they were not even as successful as they were. They were not the most convincing at times, particularly mm. early on in games, and whether it was changes or a change of attitude or, uh, or Ancelotti just uh, brought a sub or two on, they got the job done, the quality came through. As Ian said, I think the intriguing thing with Real Madrid this year is, is what the balance in the midfield is going to be. When all things have rung out and the big games really come along, Champions League, Classico, Valverde, Camavinga, Chiumani, who's going to be partnering in there? What kind of shape is it going to be? And how is he going to use Rudiger? Yeah. How does all that fit in in the end? Is it a change of shape at the back? Or, or you know, does he play left side? Or does Alaba move out there? But yeah, not a lot has changed in the sense that they have the most quality at the moment. And as Ian said, Benzema fresh off his what? Europe, UEFA. He was a uh, UEFA Champions League yeah. player of the yeah, year, yes. Yes, Carlo Ancelotti was the manager of the yeah, year. Yeah, all going swimming. You were all over it. I don't think you'd be paying much well, attention to all that. It, it, it popped up in my yeah, phone. just for osmosis. It just goes oh, through. Oh, um, very nice. And what, 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 as Craig mentioned, Ian, what's important for Madrid is while they're finding their feet and finding this best 11 with some of the new faces integrated in it, they're winning. Yeah, they, they, they keep winning and I think they will keep winning as well. And I still think they're the team to beat again in the Champions League this season. A lot of people thought they got a bit lucky last season and it was freakish the way they did progress in some of those games in the Champions League. But they kept on getting it done, including yeah. the final as well. And there on the screen is the kind of lineup they can put out and they can change that around a little bit. They've, they've got other options. So... They remain very, very strong. I think Barcelona will get closer to them this season, but if I was having a bet, I'd say Real Madrid will retain their title. Now, please tell me. Yep. Please tell me. Now, I've no idea who's producing uh, either of these games at the weekend, yes. or both. Yes. And I'm not trying to, to navigate which way the show should go. Okay. But have we got our weekly, is uh, Eden Hazard going to be back? <laughs> I mean, I mean well, must have. I mean, I can't do... I thought, I thought you were going to talk about dancing I with a mascot. I can't do a Sunday show right. on the Liga unless we have a discussion about how... 
Eden Hazard is going to resurrect himself. Yes. Yeah. Like and Lazarus. Carlo Ancelotti will say. And Carlo Ancelotti will come and say, he's doing great. He's doing and wasn't great. he wonderful last year yeah. when he came on? <laughs> and then I sit and go, no. no. And then we move on. Um, I, I, I think it's in the running order. Okay. It has to be. Oh, there we go. I'll make sure it is for you. Out. Uh, meanwhile, out. it's interesting, Ian. It was, when Barcelona were making all those acquisitions in attack, we talked about what would the best lineup be? Would it be Lewandowski, Rafinha, Dembele, Valverde, uh, um, Ferran Torres, sorry. Ansu Fati was so good when he came on, wasn't he, for the last half an hour of that game last week. He's got to start, hasn't he? Yeah, I mean, it was an amazing performance. He's a player, I think, with great charisma. He's had so many injuries, but I think even against Rayo Vallecano, when they were surprisingly held to that goalless home draw on the opening weekend, when he came on in that game, he made a bit of a difference mm. too. Not a decisive one, as it turned out. But in that game at Sociedad, he was the catalyst, and I think he kind of demands to get a start now. I mean, Rafinha so far, Rafinha got hooked, didn't he? Um, first game of the season and then left out of the starting lineup last weekend. So it's interesting what they're doing. But Lewandowski's obviously now slipping into his, his top gear. So you can probably expect, you know, one, two, three goals from him most weekends, like just like he did at Bayern. Ansu Fati, Lewandowski, Dembele at the moment, stroke Rafinha. Yeah. Ferran Torres, bit part player. Yeah. Bit part player at Man City, uh, be a bit part player at, at, at Barcelona. Uh, obviously, I think Depay is still there at the moment. Aubameyang is still there uh, at the moment. Uh, we've seen Gavi last year play wide left in the front three, but I think that was down to, to personnel. Uh, but I think, yeah, those players are mentioned. And I don't see any reason why, after the impact they had last week, why he wouldn't play. Sure. I think I would be very confused as a young player, even with the injuries that he has had last year, uh, coming in, making that kind of difference, and then, and I'm not saying he will be on the bench, but if the manager puts him on the bench again, that's a real head-scratcher, because he gives him a bit of everything. He can play wide, mm -hmm. and he can be tricky on the wide position, or he can do what he did last week in that match where he comes inside a little bit and he starts poking those little clever balls through and obviously the back heel uh, for the, uh, was it the Dembele goal? Yes. So yeah, I don't, I'd be shocked if Ansu Fati didn't start. Just a reminder, as always, we'll have you covered on ESPN Plus with every single game this weekend. Available for you, all kicks off on Saturday with Elche against Real Sociedad, but Sunday you're sorted. Getafe via Real, followed by Barca Vidalim, Espanyol against Real Madrid. Me and Craig in the studio for that. It's a long day, Craig. You can be all right. I'm going to be stuck with you. Yep, yeah, the feeling's mutual. Uh, and two games for you on Monday that include Valencia against Atletico Madrid. One of the biggest stories from Thursday's Champions League draw was, of course, Bayern Munich being drawn with Barcelona, I meaning the return of Robert Lewandowski to Bayern. This was Thomas Muller's reaction. What a nice draw for all football fans. Mr. Lewandowski, see you soon in Munich. Ich freue mich drauf. Uh, let's go, let's rock the Champions League season. Auf geht's Bayern. Well, for more on this, let's welcome in Artie Rintat, who is in Munich, where I imagine the reaction has been one of anticipation looking ahead to those games. Correct, Dan. Have a look at all the newspapers from today. Yes. The big headline, Bayern meets Lewandowski. Another Munich newspaper, the Alban Zeitung. What is it? Bayern against... Oh, can I hold it in the right place? There we go. Bayern <laughs> against Levy. And you've got to be kidding me. Bayern yes against Lewandowski. So if I was into Milan in all this, I'd be a bit like, guys, we're right here, literally, uh, because that's a pretty big draw for Bayern as well. But yeah, the, the whole dominant storyline right now is the fact that Robert Lewandowski's coming back. There's been uh, a reaction in Spain about Oliver Kahn's reaction to the draw when Barcelona came out the hat. And... He said it was misinterpreted, which I agree. I think he he just scoffed as it was as it was put, and I think that's more to do with great. We've got to we've got to field all these questions again about Robert Lewandowski, and we've literally just stopped doing that. So yeah, I think that from a from a Bayern perspective, it's a very good draw for Julian Nagelsmann, who came into the season under a lot of pressure after reports about his private life. Uh, in o over the summer, plus 
and enter to the season which was far from convincing and he needs his results and he needed them quickly but Bayern's biggest failure last season was in the Champions League against Villarreal so mm-hmm. facing big opponents early on like Barcelona like Inter is a chance for him to show how good this team is at an earlier stage in the season instead of having to wait until March April and I think can buy himself some more space and more time. Considering the way they've started this season, Archie, obviously the domestic title is pretty much wrapped up. But looking at what's going to go on in Europe, is it win or bust? I don't know if the domestic title is wrapped up just yet. It is only three games and we've not got yet into this thick of the season with three games a week and, and whatnot. So I'd, I'd ease on that on that front, even if they have looked very convincing. In, in the Champions League, difficult to tell because Nagelsmann teams, whether it's at Hoffenheim, whether it's at Leipzig or last season at Bayern, they always shoot out of the traps and then they have difficulties finishing things off towards the end of the season. So that for me is one of the biggest question marks that he's got to face, getting it right in those big crunch games. He has had good moments in European football. He's also had some not very inspiring moments in in European football, whether it's going out to or or losing 5-0 away at Manchester United. Sure, he he came back with Leipzig and did manage to qualify for the next round. But ultimately, I think that there, there are still some question marks, particularly laid by that defeat to Villarreal. Uh, Let's focus on why you're in Munich, of course, because the defending champions are in action against the Borussia Mönchengladbach, a team who come into this uh, clash as undefeated as well as Bayern. Um, Are we going to have a game, (laughs) Archie? History says yes, Sam, because Gladbach are seen as Bayern's Angstgegner, which means worry opponent or literally translating it, bogey team in German football. Last season, Gladbach were, I'd say, the biggest annoyance to Bayern, and particularly Julian Nagelsmann, because they dumped them out of the DFB Cup very early in the season in a result where Nagelsmann wasn't on the touchline, and they lost 5-0, and I remember speaking to Nagelsmann throughout last season, and you could tell that that result, anytime he was having to draw any sort of conclusions to how things were going, he always came back to that result. Now, that may be a bit worrying for Gladbach, given how Bayern responded to their last, I'd say, one of their most significant hammerings as well from last season when they lost four to away at Bochum. And at the weekend, you might have saw that they stuck seven past them. I -hmm. think there is very much revenge on the mind for Julian Nagelsmann. Daniel Farke, the Gladbach coach, has said that whilst... He doesn't think that Bayern are... It's it's too early to say whether Bayern are weaker or stronger without Lewandowski. It's about showing it over a great period of time. He has been respectful of what Bayern have done. So it's going to be interesting to see if Gladbach can still hold up this record against Bayern, which is pretty remarkable and one that I think the top teams in the Bundesliga, the likes of, of Dortmund, Leverkusen and Leipzig, should be pretty envious of right now. And... For the sake of a possible title race, the Bundesliga does need Gladbach yeah. to, to do something in this game. Uh, Archie, thank you very much. Archie, of course, will be pitch side during our coverage on ESPN+. Plus. Also on Plus, of course, the latest edition of Football Americas, where Borussia Mönchengladbach's Joe Scali sat down and chat to Seb and Huck. Now that is it. That brings us to the end of today's show. Be sure, though, to stay tuned as we've got Nadem, Ian, Shaka, and Craig back as well to answer your tweets on Extra Time. Welcome into the latest edition of Extra Time. Thank you, as always, for your tweets. Craig Burley with us here in the studio. Shaq is with us. Ian and his drapes behind him. Oh, you should get a sponsor for that. We've become an influencer when it comes to curtains, Ian. <laughs> Yeah, they're all the rage, actually. Inquiries are flooding in from all over the world. And <laughs> <laughs> Good, make some money from them. I feel them. like I'm starting a market <laughs> stall or something. <laughs> <laughs> Meanwhile, Nadam, your background is less boring than normal. It's, well, it's different, you know what I mean? It's only boring because you've seen it lots of times. It's actually really interesting if you really like monochrome oh, really? pictures of Jimi Hendrix. Yeah, you know, <laughs> yeah. subjective. Be nice, Dan, be nice, please. Where are you? 
I'm in uh, I'm in Utah, back in my old neighborhood, seeing a few friends, and then heading off somewhere else, uh, setting off to Mexico on Monday. So, yeah, again, oh. as the season cracks on, I disappear. Wow, very nice, mate. Great to have you. Mm. Yeah, exactly. You, you, need to, you need to look into that. A lot of people on this show try that very <laughs> same thing. Speaking of trait, what's one trait or skill that you didn't have while playing but wish you had? Speed. Speed? How did you oh, make up okay. how did you make up for your lack of speed? Timing. Right. No, I wasn't I was okay. I just didn't have that. Not many, a lot of people don't, but I didn't have that burst of speed. Okay. Some of them have, which is incredible. Is that something you can work on? Yeah, you can work on it. We used to have a, a speed guy at Celtic. We had a, a guy at Chelsea actually as well, uh, Eddie Murphy. But we had a, a, a Rab Thompson at Celtic. We had did some stuff after training for the fa for the fast twitch muscles. The fast twitch <laughs> muscles. Yeah. Where are they? <laughs> 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 Apparently mines were taken out of both. Wow. Fast twitch muscles, you've got to work on it in your strength. Yeah. Brilliant. Yep. Nathan, we know that pace was one of your attributes, so your fast twitch muscles must be impressive. Oh, uh, so, so impressive, Dan. But the trait, I would say, is like, I wish I would have scored more goals. So I would have wished I worked on my finishing more because, you know, it's not like I got chances every single game, but it would have been nice if when they came, I wasn't just like, they were, they were awful. As I look back, some of the misses I had, they're horrendous. And I'm, I, leave the, I leave my career, I scored like 17, 18 goals. And then I'm thinking, that's actually really bad. You know, it's basically one a season. So I wish I would have worked on my finishing more so that when I saw the goal, I didn't just panic and just kick it wide. Brilliant, brilliant Shaka. My left foot, <laughs> I was ah, no what? good. <laughs> right. No good with my left foot. Go on then. That's easy. Go on. No, I thought you were going to be mean to Shaka, but then you didn't. I'm not going to be mean. I'm going to try and be mean to you because apparently you also thought you had some fast twitch muscles and you were going to. <laughs> well, you. I don't know. You just like to post some pictures or something. I don't know. What's you... that going to do with fast twitch muscles? Look at hey, those. Hey, hey, where's the fast that. twitch muscles there? <laughs> well, where's, no, where's the muscles? Ah. Hey, what the hell is this? Hey. It's um, it's the guy who does my um, my suits. Asked if he could put some stuff on social media, and I was like, of course. So you, uh, uh, so let me get this right. Yep. You're giving him advertisement. Uh, yes. And then and run about, run about where we are. Uh, uh, yeah, exactly. What, do you pay for your suit? Of course. Uh, but you don't pay directly, do you? I, I pay for my suits. Yes. You don't pay directly. <laughs> I pay for my suits. Yes. <laughs> uh, Ian, what attribute do you wish you had? Uh, well, I wish I could tackle, wish I could score. Uh, but the only thing I was good at when playing football, I was pretty good at passing at my very modest level, but I don't want to mix it with these brilliant professionals you've got on the show here. So. <laughs> We'll you know, you're, there, you, you know which show you're on, Ian. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say. <laughs> well, you ever, what, what Ian, I want to know, Dan, Dan, what yes. I want to know is, with your fast twitch fighters, what is your 100 metre time? Oh, God, back in the day. <laughs> It was round about 12.8, I seem to remember. Yeah, that's not bad. There you go, I remember. 12.8? 12.8. Well, you could run 50 metres in 12. No, I could. I was quite fast when I was young. It must have been a... I had to run away from the bullies. It must have been, <laughs> it must have been a strong wind behind you. to be quick. Yeah, yeah back in... It a gale force wind behind you. Mullion School, that was. 12.8. Sports day, yeah. Yeah. Nadem, you must be, what, in the 10s? No, so I, I ran 11 flat when I was 15. Then wow. after that, I was in full time. So yeah, there was yeah. hope there, but yeah, it is what it is. Shaka, you sometimes see yourself as a sprinter. Yeah, I can run 109.97. <laughs> Minutes? Oh, <dear. laughs> what are we talking here? We need to get Derek Ray on the phone. Oh, why? Well, just because I'm intrigued to know that. I'm intrigued because he's going to say, just because some, somebody's going to say to him, what, what trait, what, what would you, and he's just going to say, I just wish there was German. Oh, there you go. I just wish there was German. <laughs> he loves, just, I've never known a man who loves Germany as much as he does. Oh, there you go. I don't know how we got there. Oh, I was thinking about what people wanted to have, and he just wants to be German. Right. Shaq has disappeared, apparently. Where have you gone? Germany. Sprinting. Berlin. <laughs> Where did you go? I just had to get something over there, Dan. What was over there, Shaq? <laughs> <laughs> what was over there? No, I just need some water, Dan. My throat's a little dry. 
Oh, no, <laughs> parched. Uh, to Dan, if you could be a footballer, oh, wow. what position would you ideally want to play and what does the cast think you'll fit best? I'd be a striker. But all the glory, a... all the goals, all the money, Never. all about me. Well, right, you couldn't Never. be a... You couldn't be a... Yeah. You couldn't be a goalie, you couldn't be a fullback because you get done at the back post every two minutes. Right. Uh, you couldn't play in midfield because you're, you're, you're too weak. <laughs> uh, you just get... You get, you get ragged all the So, striker, place. striker. You might be a good low that. centre of ground, no, Aguero you, West. You are the perfect for that fancy Dan, excuse the pun, that yeah. fancy Dan number 10 who does not a lot <laughs> during the game. That's you, all day, every day. Yeah. Not a lot, just prancing around yep. like everybody owes you freaking favour in life. While everybody else runs around, sc scurries around, doing all the work, and then you go around. Yep. Pointing and ah, morning and feels like it's got a little personal. <laughs> <laughs> I, may, I, I, I may have I, I, I may have I may have come across uh, two or three of those particular characters in my career. Uh, very talented. Yeah, thank you. Rather not yeah, you. Yes. Rather, rather frustrating. Yeah. Talented. But it's even worse when you have two of them in the one team. Right. And you think you can go to France and win. Oh, it's amazing dear. that. And oh. you can't. Oh dear. <laughs> Some old scars have been yeah. exposed. Let's put Lubomir Moravchik and Ayo Berkovic in right. the same team. Yeah. yeah, that'll work. Away from home. I think not. Oh, okay, good. We're, we're talking about me. Not your past well, failings that, in France. Well, that's 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 my whole point. Yep. You'd, you'd always bring it back to you. Yeah, exactly. Number 10, fancy number 10, Nadem, do you think? For you, no, 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 no. You, you, as Craig was saying, but it's like it's more so the free roll because you wouldn't literally not want to get involved in anything structured. You just go wherever you wanted, get in the ball, <laughs> press this guy, press this guy. Ah, I don't know. But to be honest, you, as the question says, you kind of suit a left back, like a right footed left back for a team right. that hits channel balls. So I think that's who you realistically are. I'll be honest with you, you, you honestly, I, I, I could, if you ever played at any sort of decent level, yes, top level, right? Yeah. Honestly, I swear to God, even in today's rules, laws, yep. somebody would absolutely smash you. Right. Again, it's the fact that you do Oh, yeah. Again, it's I mean, I think I, well, <laughs> I think I would even yeah, jump out of retirement. No, I would jump out. I think I would, I would go to the game. I would actually go to the game with my boots on. Very de denims. My boots on, just jump on the pitch. There you go. But honestly, You'd be in your head before you even got on the pitch. Yes. It would yeah. be. Yeah. I've seen it happen. All right, really? Oh, and then people just go missing. Well, you're talking about Vinnie Jones kick Ga Gavin Peacock with a big toe right, in the, right up the back side. Right. In the tunnel. Proper, like, full on smash. I saw it uh, before the game and said, I'm going to hit. That's, that's just the start of it. Yeah, I don't think I'd like that. No, I don't think you would. No, I don't. I think you would start crying. I, I definitely would start crying if Vinnie Jones kicked me at the bum. Definitely. Go to the manager and say, a big man kicked me. A big man kicked me. I don't like it. I For don't Ian, what are some of your favourite grounds to go and commentate at? The favourite grounds to commentate at? Um, uh, number one, Maracanã. Two, well, Camp Nou stuff. in Barcelona at home. Arsenal's best because it's the best commentary position in terms of being able to see the pitch. We're, we're very simple folk like that. We go to the places, we like the places where we've got the best view of the game and Arsenal's probably the best in the Premier League for that. The, the most difficult, without any question, is West Ham United, where it's about 80 yards just to the near touchline because it's one of those shallow bowls. It was built for athletics in the Olympic Games. So... Right. Um, no, none of us look forward to commentating at West Ham, but I've given you three there anyway. <laughs> Arsenal, <laughs> has, Arsenal still got the slowest lift from the media room up to the uh, up to the gantry, and yeah, yeah, so, yeah. Can it's miss the a game slowest. Right tell, tell your story, right, Craig? It's the slowest in the world. What story? When you were commentating with Derek in Scotland. Oh, I thought you meant. I tell you, the worst one I did was the San Siro. Right. We were so high at the San Siro. I was working with Jim Proudfoot doing a Milan derby and we can, and obviously we weren't covering uh, both the Milan teams every week so it was a bit of last minute homework going sure. on, getting in there, working for ESPN UK at the time and thinking oh, this will be okay, we'll get a really good view, of course not being anywhere like the host broadcaster, right up the back of the main stand Oof. and we got up there and the monitor was about the size of the phone Nice. and I was like, Jim, 
I think we've got a problem. <laughs> <laughs> hardly see it, but it's a great game. Can hardly see the field. The one it's no, the one with Derek was quite a simple one. Uh, Chinese whispers. I may have said something in the commentary that people got upset about, and uh, some guy phoned another guy in the stand from his house and said, "Hey, Craig Burley said that." Blah blah blah. And before you knew it. Half the stand had turned round to the gantry. Right. Was singing very rude song <laughs> that was picked up by the microphone. Uh, and what I was laughing. Said Derek Ray kept. Derek said, "We do apologise for the language." And he was on. What are we going to do to the director? What are we going to do? Carry on. Carry. Anyway, next thing you know, there's at least one or two faces climbing up the. Uh, what do you call it? The scaffolding. Right. It was erected to put the gantry in place, and these um, very irate people were trying to get on the gantry. Right. And something happened on the pitch. Keeper makes a save. Oh, so there's replays coming in. My monitor's here. And I'm, I've got the mic and then I'm looking at the monitor. Try to do, and I've got a face here. <laughs> it's, not any, it's, it's not anybody who should be there. And he's going. <laughs> so we had to, and Derek was uh, panicking. Right. And he kept getting on the uh, the lazy to the director, asking for more security. Brilliant. So we're actually trying to get on the gantry. Yeah. And it turns out what they thought I'd said wasn't you hadn't what said. I'd said. Well, there you go. But by the time it had reached a phone call to this yeah. guy and it come up the chain, it had changed. Right. It's part and parcel. There you are. I've been back a few times. Making friends everywhere you go. I went back. The next time I went back, right, this is sweet to God, same stadium. I went back, we're in, a, we're in a position about 45 minutes before the kickoff. And uh, there was one, two people in the stand beneath us. There was nobody else in the, hardly anybody else in the crowd. And this guy, he was a bit of a meathead, it has to say. Right. No skinhead, bit looked like Robbo, but with 25 pounds more. Okay. Right. Big fat unit. Right. Uh, Maybe more than 25 pounds. Nasty looking, yeah, 50. Nasty looking Canadian. He just stood. This is no word of a lie. And it was only Derek and I and the sound engineer. And he just stood about five meters from me and stared at me. Wow. Like we were doing rehearsals wow. and checking sound and nobody else in the ground. And I was like, I kept saying to Derek, it's a little bit worrying here, Derek, this guy is And well, so Derek was having a <laughs> fits. I'd have cried again. <laughs> but he never, uh, apparently he never did it. Oh, wow. Lovely. Uh, Shaka, what was the fastest transfer to materialize in your career? Did you know well in advance that something was cooking or did it present itself suddenly and you had to make a snap decision? The fastest, well, well the fastest was, was my move from Newcastle to West Ham because um, I went on a free transfer and that was sorted out months in advance. So just let my contract run out and new contract signed. So that was pretty simple and straightforward. Was QPR simple for you, Nathan? Well, it was actually my first proper transfer. So I remember I played, actually played one game for City that season in the league. It was Wigan, finished that game. And then the next day, the one of the directors said, oh, we've uh, we've had a bid come through for uh, from QPR. And I was like, okay, that's nice. And he said, okay, yeah, but you've got to go down there like tonight. I was like, excuse me? <laughs> so the next thing I'm down in London negotiating the deal. Then the day after, I'm just training at QPR. It was one of the weirdest feelings for me. And to be honest, like, Maybe that's my own naivety from somebody who's never really left the club, but the way it happens is so fast. And then, you know, for them, it's just, it's literally just business. And the other one actually was when I was a free agent and I was speaking with RSL and they put an offer and all that stuff. And I was waiting for my, uh, my visa to come through. And I kept saying, I don't know how long it's going to be. Might be two weeks, might be three weeks, might be whatever. Then I got a text saying the passport's arrived. I texted someone at RSL. Then I was on a flight the next morning. My life had changed just like that. So wow. the speed of these sort of things, it's, uh, it's very much within football and yeah, it's uh, it's good fun sometimes. And you don't have a chance to say goodbye to anyone or anything, it's just that, boom. Oh, uh, yeah, it's just, yeah, it's gone. Wow. Yeah. But then, sorry to just give you one more story, Dan. I remember in 2012, uh, it was the end of the transfer window in August, sorry, 2011, the August transfer window. And I was training with basically like the under 12s at City. So, you know, the writing was kind of on the wall. Um, so it's the last day of the window and I thought I was leaving. So I packed up all my boots and stuff and said bye to everyone. 
sat in my house, watched Sky Sports News as nothing happened, and then I had to come back in the next day with the same bags and said, hi everyone, I'm back. I've got three more months of this now. Oh, wow. Couldn't the worst could have been yeah. Peter Rod and Wingy hang, uh, yeah. hiding in the bushes at Loftus Road. Yeah, that's Chelsea true. Chelsea was mine. But anyway, let me tell you another Derek story quickly. Right. Talking about naivety. <laughs> so I think it was our second game together, but we were doing Hib Celtic. It was a cracking match at Easter Road. Good atmosphere, blah, blah, blah. But Derek had only just come back from America. Okay. Right? Uh, so he hadn't been broadcasting in the UK for quite a few years. Although he must have knew the land, the lay of the land. And but I think he missed understood that the natives in Scotland get very restless very quickly. So he said to me after the game, uh, oh, great game, mate. I really, I really enjoyed it. I really enjoyed that first fantastic atmosphere. And he was walking about and I said, there's no word of a lie. I said to him, give it three months working with me, Derek, and you're gonna need to wear a space suit every time you walk in and yeah. he looked at me and I don't know if he knew what, he, what I meant but uh, within two or three months he was guilty by association yeah because he's with you and you're anti everybody I'm anti anti and you're anti anti so it was quite funny though because he was like he went remember that time you told me I went yeah 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 so he, he must have thought he must have thought maybe everybody's maybe my years in America people in Scotland have mellowed no no Ian have you upset people before with your comments <laughs> Just about every week now, I think. Perfect. <laughs> yeah. if, if, you, if you go on social media, every set of commentators or fans in the Premier League think you're biased against their team. So we're all guilty of that every week. And Craig will know exactly what I'm talking about, I think, with that one. Do you go and Google Ian Dark to see what people are saying about you? <laughs> no, I, I don't look at it. I don't. I advise everybody do not look at what they're saying on social media because yeah. it's um, it, it's pretty it's pretty toxic, isn't it? A lot of it. It's all nonsense. Yes, isn't it? it's not real. Uh, it's not real. Final. Oh, Shaka, we've had a lot of questions on this topic. Whatever happened to your power rankings? <clears throat> uh, they'll be coming in a few weeks' time. Still too early in the season. Which be a few weeks. You've got, I, I need more data, Dan. I need more wow. data. <laughs> that is you, slack. If I was you, I'd be getting worried about the phasing out process. <laughs> what, what, the, uh, all right. Yeah, but he's the one who's initiated the phasing out. That's the thing. Yeah, he's trying to hand it. He's trying to hand it. Our producer says they're going to be back next Thursday, Shaq. No, no, not next Thursday. No, we say. Wow, yeah, Shaq has power here. Uh, that is it, that's good. He didn't even know what, what he, he didn't even. The producer didn't even know what days the games were on at the weekend. Oh, no. They send a separate email out to say, oh, I made a mistake. Maybe you never noticed. No, we did. There you go. We did notice. Um, have fun in Mexico, Nate. And then he sent me a text. He sent me a text. What time, what time, what time do you need to be in today? Right. He said to me, 5.30. Yes. Right. 5.25. You're in here. 5.25. Yeah. I'm walking along from my desk. Yes. And I think, he texts me. Yeah. There could be trouble ahead. Wow. Phone buzzes. Yeah. Take your time, we're doing a Bundesliga segment. Well, that's good. What a, what a, what, what, I needed to know that. What a hard life you have. <laughs> what that? It's like, I just don't need to know that. Oh, look, look, there you go. It's the Oscar. <laughs> <laughs> I don't need to know that. Uh, we'll be back. To, you're off tomorrow, aren't you? I think so. I'll make a decision later. Stevie and Shaka with me tomorrow to reflect on some of those big games in the Premier League.